This podcast is sponsored by Lightstep. Lightstep delivers confidence at scale for those who develop, operate, and rely upon today's powerful software applications. Answer questions and diagnose 100% of anomalies, spanning mobile, monoliths, and microservices across every service in real time. Visit lightstep.com. Hello and welcome to the InfoQ Podcast. My name is Wes Rice and I'm your host. Today on the show, I'm talking to Duncan McGregor. Duncan works for Oracle Labs on Graal and Truffle Ruby. Today, we'll be discussing some of the work that's being done with the experimental Graal compiler, a universal VM for running applications written in JavaScript, Python, Ruby, R, JVM-based languages, and even LLVM-based languages such as C, C++, Objective-C, and even Swift. We'll be talking about the relationship of Truffle to Growl. We'll talk about a language that's been implemented with Truffle to run on Growl, Truffle Ruby. And finally, we'll wrap with the discussion of Project Loom and its relationship to all of this we've been talking about with Truffle and Growl. This is a densely packed podcast that covers everything from making Ruby concurrent, leveraging Growl, to compiling LLVM-based languages to run on the JVM. As always, thanks for joining us on your jogs, runs, and commutes. Duncan, thanks for joining us on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. So last week we were both in London. What did you think of QCon London? It was good. It was an excellent chance to, to meet people and talk about Loom and Graal. I made some interesting connections there. Yeah, it was a good, fun conference. One of the things I like about it is it's a polyglot kind of cross-cutting conference. So you get this like infusion from different language stack. Yeah. All right. So in your talk, the talk was called Graal, not just a new JIT for the JVM. You talked about some of the performance differences between C2 and Graal, among other things. People can go watch that talk, but what's kind of like the TLDR of the talk? I guess the TLDR is that Graal can do a better job of optimizing modern sort of styles of coding like streams and Scala and things like that, which uh, take a more functional approach. But as well as that, it has some trade-offs at the moment, which we need to deal with in order to make it something that can be a default JIT in the JVM. But it can do more things than that. It can work for other languages. It can compile code that's not going to be running in a normal JVM. And it can be embedded in applications in interesting ways. So we can do lots of interesting stuff with it in the long term. And because it's written in Java, we can build really interesting frameworks using it. I didn't realize that. So Graal is fully written in Java? Yes. The JIT is entirely written in Java. A compiler interface, JVM CI, is mostly written in Java. I think there's a small set of stubs inside Hotspot to communicate with it. Sort of thing. But almost the entire thing is written in Java. I guess we should back up a bit and just kind of touch on Graal. What is it and where did it come from? Graal is a new just-in-time compiler for the JVM. It's a project that's been going for quite a few years now, and it came out of some work Thomas Vertinger was doing. I'd have to go and check whether Truffle as a framework started before Graal or whether Graal existed already. And it's got some roots in the Maxine VM research project that went on years ago, which was a JVM entirely written in Java, or as close to entirely as they could manage. So you mentioned Truffle. What's the relationship of Truffle and Graal? Truffle is a language implementation framework. The idea is, rather than trying to have to write a compiler for your language, you can write an interpreter. And as long as you do it in a specific type of way, and you use this framework and you follow some rules, then as you run your program through the interpreter, it will be specialized to create a compiled version. So you don't have to write a compiler, but by noting what goes on in the interpreter, we can generate a just-in-time compiled version of your program. So what does that mean? Is that a higher level of abstraction now that working with that has some trade-offs like performance implications? Yes, you're working at very much the sort of level of a quite high level interpreter for your language. So if you have an if statement in the language or an if expression, that would be a node that says, I shall evaluate the condition node. And depending on the result it gives me, I shall evaluate the true node or the false node. So your interpreter looks very much like a simple, obvious interpreter, but you can then write some optimization. So For example, if you were doing string equality, you could write a specialization saying, if the two underlying objects are the same object, I'll just return true. I don't need to do anything more than that. If I know they're different lengths or whatever, I'll return false and 
so on. I mean, you write a set of specializations and in the background, this means that when you run your program, one of those will be picked if it's true and profiled as, is this the only one that will ever be true here or, or can others be true and does it need to do more work in the background? It allows optimizations to be done at a much higher level so we can experiment a lot more with how to make programs run quickly. So what is the implementation for Truffle? I mean, is it a language that you use? Is it an implementation for given languages? It's a set of libraries, some annotations, and some annotation processing that goes on when you compile your Java to create generated classes that will then be used in the background. Let's back up again. We so we jumped kind of over to Truffle. I want to talk just a bit more about Graal. So Graal is kind of a replacement for C2. What does it look like to actually replace C2 with Graal? So from a user's point of view, at the moment, because it's experimental, they should only need to add some command line options and everything should work the same way. From our point of view, well, it's a lot easier to work with. C2 is notoriously quite hard to work with and to become proficient and productive with because it's quite complicated. It's written in C++. You've got to understand a lot about hotspot in order to really do good stuff with it. Graal is in some ways a a lot simpler to understand. If you've got any knowledge of compilers, you can look at the class sort of structure and you can see there's a high tier and a low tier and a mid tier and things like that. And it's quite easy to see that you've got something for, say, your AMD64 architecture that takes a set of nodes that come in and produces a set of AMD64 specific nodes. And those transformations are quite easy to understand normally. At the sort of front end of of what happens to your bytecode, it's a lot easier to write transformations and substitutions. So when dealing with JVM bytecode, both C2 and Graal will have specific things they're looking for and trying to replace. Sometimes it's entire methods. Sometimes it's invocations of methods. Some of these are ones that are entirely implemented down in the native hotspot VM. So you just want to call relevant routine in there. And some are just cases where you know that you can do encryption better than can be represented by bytecode because you've got specific instructions available. So you want to flag that this encryption operation is being carried out or something like that. So one of the questions I have is you highlighted C2 is written in C++, obviously a little bit more complicated, but already hinted at it earlier that Graal is more performant. What do you see with C2 versus Graal on performance? We're generally seeing better performance with Graal. There's a couple of benchmarks where we're on par or slightly behind with the community edition of Graal. There is also an enterprise edition, which is a closed source version, which has some extra optimizations. I believe the enterprise edition is better in all the benchmarks that they've tried, but obviously there could be one that that it's not as good in. But hopefully if a benchmark is found or a real use case is found where it's not as fast, it's easier to understand what needs to be done and to fix that. We all know how uh, benchmarks can be applied to the use case that best suits a platform or language. What are the use cases that like Growl excels at and which are the ones that maybe it doesn't excel so well at? As I said earlier, it excels at things like Scala and anything that does stuff with lambdas in Java. It's very good at dealing with normally. I guess the line or is the statement pretty much that Growl is a great replacement for C2 period? Is that the stance or is it for certain use cases that it's a good replacement for C2? At the moment, it's a good replacement for C2, providing you've got a long enough running program that the extra time required to just-in-time compile your just-in-time compiler, because it's written in Java, is going to be worth it and you can stand that startup penalty. Let's talk about that startup penalty. What's that look like in real terms? So there is an option when you start for JVM to bootstrap for JVM CI compiler. And on my machine, that takes about eight seconds, which is non-trivial. We have a plan which we're working towards to ahead of time compile Graal because most of the work of a compiler is the same, whether you're just in time compiling or ahead of time compiling. And if we can do that then we'll be able to link it into the JVM as a shared library and you won't pay that startup penalty. There are some other cases where it may have a downside as well. 
in its current form, it's using the main Java heap for your compilation. So if you've tuned your memory carefully down to just what you need, or you have tuned your garbage collector to expect only the rate of garbage that your application creates, which if you've been careful, you may have very low, then using Graal will throw off that assumption. And it also will pollute the type profile information gathered about your program. So it may not be perfect in those cases, but if we compile it into a shared library, then we can avoid those problems. Okay, so Truffle's a framework that can be used to develop languages. And you talked a bit about why that's so impressive. I think I read somewhere that Truffle.js, for example, had 80,000 lines of code compared to like 1.7 that are in V8. Can you talk a bit more about how you're able to be so concise to implement something like JavaScript in Gosh, I can't even do the math on 16 times less code. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure it's a totally fair comparison. V8 obviously <laughs> got to include its own JIT, its own garbage collector, and a whole host of things like that, which won't be in the, the camp for Truffle JS. That is a good point, but we can share between languages a lot of the infrastructure. So we don't need every language to implement a just-in-time compiler because that's Grohl's job and partly Truffle's job. It doesn't need to implement a garbage collector because that's the underlying VM's job. And various things like how to make, for example, regular expressions fast. We can share a lot of code between languages for a regular expression engine rather than each language having to have its own. So these are all parts that are common between a lot of languages. But above and beyond that, a lot of the ways of implementing a, a dynamic language can be expressed in our interpreter in a very small way. So if you think of something like the addition operator in JavaScript, it's got a lot of cases if you go and read the specs of what's the left-hand side and what's the right-hand side and what do you have to do in all of these cases. And you can write a node saying, call it plus node and say, I'll evaluate the left-hand side to get that. I'll evaluate the right-hand side to get that. And then I've just got to say, which of these cases is it? Is it an int and an int, or a long and a long, or a double and a double, or string and a double, or whatever? And you, you just write them all down and what each of them does, and the generated code from Truffle will take care of picking the right case and optimizing for that if it's the only one you're going to see. So as you're talking, back in my head, I'm sitting here thinking about just like types and things and different language, dynamically typed, strongly typed languages. How do you handle types, for example, with Truffle? So we have an interop framework. It's being redesigned a bit as we speak, but the principle remains roughly the same. There are certain operations that you can ask an object or try to perform on an object from another language. You can ask if it's of various basic types. You can ask if it has keys, whether you can read things from it. And that covers quite a decent set of primitive types and arrays. So you can easily say, I want to get the first entry out of the array or something like that. You can ask whether the object is executable, in which case you can try, say, execute yourself with some arguments or whether it accepts messages. And then some other messages geared towards lower level interop with C like and other low level languages where you can ask if the object can provide a native version of itself and whether it can provide a pointer to itself and that sort of thing. And this allows you to pass objects between languages and often just work with them without having to, to know that they're from another language. You work on Truffle Ruby. Tell me a bit about the Truffle Ruby project and the use cases where it does really well. I think Chris Seaton started it quite a number of years ago as part of his PhD, but you'd have to check that. And it started off life in JRuby and sharing a lot of code before we branched away from them a couple of years ago because we were starting to share less code and less of the implementation. And now we use some of the same libraries for text encoding and things like that. But other than that, there's no real code shared between us. Let's talk about that for just a second. We'll come back to Truffle Ruby, but I want to talk about the distinction between JRuby and Truffle Ruby because that's not really clear to me. 
So JRuby has been around for a while. I remember using it many, many years back. I remember actually seeing that it had better performance back than uh, MRI, Matt's Ruby interpreter, years ago, at least from my memory. So what is that relationship between what JRuby was and then where Truffle Ruby came in? Because Truffle's using the Truffle framework to be able to implement it. So I'm unsure of that connection. So JRuby is aiming much more at integration with other Java classes, I think. It has Java classes for many of the underlying Ruby data types, which probably, unfortunately, are public, so people can implement their own versions and make them appear as Ruby classes. It has a fairly wide API. At this point, it's very hard to reduce to anything smaller because people are using so many bits of it. I think it has an interpreter that it uses initially, and it has a compiler to JVM bytecode and then relies on the JIT in the JVM to run that generated bytecode as fast as possible. And Charlie's done a lot of very impressive work, but he's had to you know, introduce his own intermediate representation in his bytecode compiler to try and do enough analysis. And yeah, he's done an awful lot to get it to that state. Truffle Ruby is not trying to compile things to JVM classes at all. It's just using this interpreter and using the Truffle framework to just in time compile only the things we need. Okay, so like back now to Truffle Ruby, what's the outcome? What are you seeing with performance numbers? What are you seeing with Truffle Ruby? So the biggest thing we're seeing, I think, is that we can use a lot of native Ruby extensions which JRuby has to maintain their own versions of because they don't support native Ruby C extensions. Translation there, I can install any gem and run with it, no problem? That's the ultimate goal. We're getting there. We still have- <laughs> Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some compatibility problems that we're ironing out, but we're getting very close. So we used to maintain a large set of patches for various gems. We've been able in the last few months to reduce that down to a much smaller set of patches, And we've got people now testing a lot more of those gems for us. And we hope to persuade various projects to start testing in CI so that we know that we work and we continue to work. There's still some compatibility corners, corner cases that I'm trying to hunt down at the moment. So I've spent the last day searching for why a particular gem, when you run its test suite, causes a seg fault. I think I've found the answer, and it's the case of, you know, how big can a fix num be in Ruby, and how big can it be in Truffle Ruby? And the answer is slightly different, and it can throw off an assumption and cause somebody to make a string buffer with one character too small, or something like that. There's some little niggling things like that, but we're working our way through them, and the more people test with these things, the more we'll get, we'll find and fix Let's talk about, for example, that segfall issue. Presumably, I mean, you don't know exactly what it is at the moment, but you think you found it. What would a fix look like? What's entailed with fixing something like that using Truffle? In this case, it's making sure that we tell a C extension that a number is a fixed num only if it fits within 63 bits rather than 64. And then their logic for when a number can be converted into a long in C, they don't have to think of any new cases. Whereas if you say 64 bits, you can have the largest negative long that you can have, which if you take the negative of it, will return the same thing. Because two's complement arithmetic is, is horrible sometimes. How do you onboard or how do you encourage people to test with Truffle Ruby to kind of catch these corner cases? And how do you recommend them just updating you about these changes, these problems? If they want to try it and they've got a gem that they use, then go to uh, gralvm.org or build uh, Truffle Ruby themselves and install the gem using the absolutely standard gem commands or bundle or whichever thing your build process uses and try running your test suite. If stuff doesn't work, just report it to us as a bug on GitHub and we'll talk to you. One other project that you've been working on, I think as it relates to Truffle Ruby at least, is Project Loom. So let's talk a few minutes about that. What is Loom first off and why do we need another continuation project? Loom is a project that aims to add one-shot delimited continuations to the JVM. So one-shot means that you can run the continuation once and you can't run from the same point multiple times. So you can't yield in a loop and run that loop twice with the same values. 
if you run it once, then the continuation you've got at the end is for the next yield. So it's delimited, which means that it's only the bit of code inside the continuation that you yield from. So you've got a fairly small stack. Okay, so Kotlin implements coroutines within the JVM. So is that to say Kotlins are not one-shot continuations? They certainly appear to be one-shot because they don't allow for cloning. Okay, so they are one-shot. The important sort of distinguishing factor with something like Kotlin's continuations is they're implemented, I believe, entirely in the compiler. So for them to work, every method between the point you start a continuation and where you want to yield from it on the stack has to be sort of visible to the compiler and know about continuations. The difference with Project Loom is the stuff on the stack between those two points doesn't have to know about continuations at all. So supposing you're wanting to write something like a web service, it gets a request in, it's going to make a database request, which is probably going to involve some network connection and some network IO, and then it's going to return some data based on the result of that request. We'd like continuations because we would like that blocking I.O. not to block a native thread. So we'd like to be able to run that entire web request inside some sort of lightweight thread, which underneath we build on continuations. And you as the user should not have to be aware of that. So you just write a normal bit of code for your web request, for, for dealing with your web request that calls the database library and whatever. If that is running in a fiber, right down at the bottom, the I.O. routine knows that it's running in a fiber, and rather than doing synchronous blocking I.O., will do the I.O. asynchronously and park that fiber, and thus allow another one to run. The user code you've written doesn't need to know this process is going on at all. So it just looks like standard synchronous code that you might write without anything special. You're not putting something to sleep. You're not running something, waiting for it to return. You just write standard synchronous code. And under the covers, it's implementing the fiber. Yeah, that's the idea. So Alan Bateman and various people have been doing some excellent work on the Java standard library. So that the guts of that understand whether they're running on a fiber or a heavyweight thread. But that's most of the work that needs to be done. And then your web server needs to know to run things in a fiber rather than in a heavyweight thread. But often that can be done by just giving it a lambda that tells it how to run each web request. So can you explain just a little bit more about fiber versus thread? Continuations are a rather low level thing. And they've got some difficult semantics to expose to users. If they're not one shot, what happens if you claim the lock and then you release it? Can you release a lock twice? That doesn't sound good. Equally, could you run a finalizer twice or a cleanup routine twice as you exit from a method? There's a lot of uh, potential gotchas like that. So they're a very low-level API, which we may not even expose to most users. Fibers are just like threads. They are a thread of execution. The difference between a thread and a fiber at the moment is that fibers are only continuations and they're running somewhere on a heavyweight thread. They're much more lightweight. They take up less space in the VM, so you can have a lot more of them. We are looking at an API for fibers based around ideas called structured concurrency, which imposes some restrictions that you don't normally have with threads, but they provide useful payoffs. So you can't just start a fiber and have it outlive what started it. So you can write code by saying, I want to start 10 fibers to do these things. I'll wait for them all to finish, and then I get to continue. Or I wait for one of them to finish, I cancel the others, and then I continue, or something like that. It's a very good sort of way to restrict the use of threads or fibers to simplify the reasoning about concurrent code. What are we talking about when we compare lightweight fibers with threads? Are we talking hundreds, thousands? What's the order of magnitude? We can run millions of fibers in a JVM. The, the, the stack size for a fiber is as much as you use. So if it, they're just small stacks, they'll be very small. If you go really, really deep, there'll be larger stacks and they'll take up more space. But a lot of fibers are going to be very small. So stack sizes, a couple of hundred bytes and a little bit of overhead for the objects to represent them. Presumably fibers are being implemented in the VM, not in the language itself. 
Continuations are being implemented in the VM. Fibers are entirely implemented in Java. Okay. Interesting. So fibers sound amazing. When are they a bad idea though? When should you use a thread? When you're doing something that is CPU bound rather than something that's doing blocking IO or whatever. If you're constrained on CPU resources, it doesn't matter how many fibers you have, you can't do more calculations and you will get better performance just running your thread and letting the operating system reschedule it every so often. That's the main case. We may provide an API to allow the creation of heavyweight fibers within the sort of structured concurrency model, which might be better than people creating threads, but that's still an area we're very much actively experimenting and trying to decide what is the right API for this sort of thing. So what's the connection between Project Loom and Truffle Ruby, for you at least? (laughs) So Ruby has a fiber model as well. It has a slightly different one from the one we're building for the JVM. In Ruby, you can create a fiber. That fiber will run in the context of your thread. The fiber can never be run on a different thread. And it runs until it yields. And it can either yield to the underlying main thread or it can yield to another fiber. That's a slightly different model from the one we'd like to present for Java, but it is one we can build with continuations. So we've done a small amount of work to prototype this. It literally took an afternoon and not even all of an afternoon. And we could switch our fibers implementation from using Java Lang thread for every fiber to using these continuations. And we could show that you you can run a few million of these in Truffle Ruby on the JVM and it works. One of the complaints about Ruby has been the multi-threaded application issues, right? So, yeah. So Ruby, like Python and a lot of other interpreted languages, although it can have multiple OS threads, it has, well, Ruby calls it uh, GVL, I think the global value lock. Python has something similar, the GIL, the global interpreter lock. What this means is that only one thread of execution gets to run Ruby or Python or whatever at a time. And that makes the implementation of interpreters much easier. You don't have to worry about concurrency everywhere where you're doing stuff. Ruby level code should still worry about concurrency if it's going to have multiple threads. You can't guarantee exactly where the VM will switch the execution of threads. And it may not be the places you expect I've seen a lot of code survive for interpreted languages, sometimes for decades, where it had real concurrency issues and it just got away with it by luck. In Truffle Ruby, we don't have quite the same system of a GVL. We can run Ruby completely concurrently. We do use a lock when we're running C extensions because most C extensions are written with some assumptions that only one extension will be running at a time. And C extensions have a mechanism for releasing that lock and then reacquiring it. So C extensions that do know what they're doing and can run without interacting with the Ruby interpreter can release the lock and keep running in a thread, and then another thread can acquire that lock. But yes, we implement that at the moment. We'd like to provide a mechanism by which C extensions that know they are okay to run concurrently could say when they initialize themselves, I'm okay to run concurrently, I don't need locks, I'm good. That's one possibility. The other is we might implement one lock per C extension, and then your database connector could run quite happily in parallel with something like an HTTP parser or something like that that was written in C, or an image, or some sort of PNG library or something like that. Very nice. So what's the future look like? When will we see Truffle Ruby as a viable production language? We're going to be remaining experimental at least till next year. We'll see what happens then. We're getting closer. We can run some Rails applications at this point. The performance is looking okay last time I looked, but we are always going to work to get it better. And there's some serious work being done on Truffle to look at how we can improve the time to reach peak performance, which is our main issue in performance at the moment. But yeah, we are going to remain experimental at least for next year. Well, very cool. Duncan, thanks for joining us on the InfoQ podcast. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you.